Yeah. Hi. Uh, welcome to our Google Plus Hangout on human trafficking in 2014. I'm Nicholas Kristoff from the New York Times. We have a terrific panel here. And uh, we will also be addressing your questions. We've had some questions that have come in uh, in advance. And you will see also on your screen a chance to raise some new questions, to um, vote up other questions that are particularly important to you. And uh, so let's get started. Uh, I'd like to first introduce our uh, great panel here. Uh, we have uh, David Batstone, who is the co-founder of Not For Sale and also uh, author of a book of the same name, uh, Not For Sale. David, welcome. Hey, thanks, Nick, for uh, hosting us. Sure. Uh, and next on your screen, we have Gary Haugen, the head of uh, International Justice Mission. And uh, congratulations to you, Gary, on a new book, uh, The Locust Effect, uh, right. whose subtitle kind of explains it. Um, uh, why the end of poverty requires the end of violence. Welcome, right. Gary. Thanks, Nick. Um, and next on your screen, we see Rachel Lloyd, uh, a trafficking survivor herself and uh, author of the um, terrific autobiographical book, uh, Girls Like Us. Uh, welcome, Rachel. Hi, Nick. Thank you. Um, and um, then um, next on your screen, uh, Susan Bissell, who is the head of uh, uh, child protection at UNICEF and working on these issues uh, globally. Welcome, Susan. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, Rachel, let me let me start with you. Maybe um, you're both a survivor, and you're working here in New York City through Gems Girls with some, you know, on the very front lines of this issue. And we had some questions that came in on Twitter and elsewhere, um, kind of skeptical questions about this whole field. And I kind of want to clear the air and address this. The their question uh, one. One person, um, uh, Carol Fenton, was uh, suggesting that advocates conflate um, sex work and, and, and sex trafficking, for example. Um, uh, somebody else asked, uh, so can you, can you address that a little bit? Or, um, I, I think that sometimes there is a perception that, you know, this, that this community um, uh, exaggerates the degree to which this is modern slavery. And I'd just like to address that right off the start. Um, so I'm glad you kind of put that out there because I think especially this month uh, with the Super Bowl happening um, in the next few weeks there's been a lot of hype about the Super Bowl and the Super Bowl being the largest incidence of human <coughs> trafficking in the country. Um, that's not true um, and I think those kind of stories really do do a disservice to the work that everyone on the panel and folks around the country are really doing I mean I think you know do I think some advocates conflate some stuff yes absolutely and I think one of the challenges is that this is such when you've worked with trafficking victims when you've seen young people tattooed and branded when you've seen talk to girls who have been burnt with irons and beaten and raped multiple times, it's hard not to get really, really passionate about it. Um, some of the stuff that we all see is so egregious and so heinous that you want to stand on a mountaintop and shout and tell people this is actually happening and it's happening in our country and it's happening all over the world. Um, so do I think sometimes that that passion and that like vigor kind of gets lost in the accurate stats and yes and I think that's something as trafficking advocates we have to be honest about and address but to minimize because where it hurts us right is it, it minimizes what's really happening um, we know and, and other folks will speak to this that there really is human trafficking and human slavery happening both globally and in the US to both international victims to domestic victims to young people to men to women labor sex I mean it's it's a global issue and to minimize that by saying that there's a few folks who have inflated some numbers or gotten really excited um, I, I think is problematic and working every day with young people um, in New York City and just knowing that that's only like a portion of the young people that are being exploited in New York City every day yeah you know, I, Rachel I mean it sounds like your point is that yes yeah, sure there are some people who uh, are in the commercial sex world uh, of their own volition and one can acknowledge that without undermining 
one's passion for addressing situations where, you know, 15-year-old girls are being pimped out on the streets and, as you say, uh, tattooed by those pimps where every penny is going to the pimps, this kind of thing. Yeah, I th look, I think there are adults who are in the commercial sex industry um, who made certain decisions. I mean, I think when we begin to look at what were those decisions based on, were those decisions based from poverty and desperation and homelessness and not being able to feed your children, um, those aren't right. really great decisions made out of an option of choices. Are there a handful of folks in the sex industry who did have options? Um, yeah, but they're in the minority. They're not the majority of women, children, men around the world who are being trafficked. Mm, great. David, maybe I can um, turn to, to you next with another kind of clear the air kind of question that, that came in. Um, uh, Pearl Lee asked uh, whether legalization of commercial sex, you know, legalization and regulation would uh, help reduce trafficking, whether the model should be less a crackdown than, you know, a more permissive model. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced that's the case. We work in um, the Netherlands and Amsterdam and the Red Light District where, of course, legalization of prostitution has happened for several decades and it really um, has not diminished the amount of trafficking that happens. The work that we do, um, uh, uh, partnering with women who are um, behind the windows in the Red Light District of Amsterdam, we find that three out of four of them come from poor rural areas of Eastern Europe, particularly three countries, Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary. So if, you know, if it were simply a matter of free choice, a matter of empowerment, you'd wonder why more young Dutch girls would say, gee, should I go work at you know, a, a low ING or should I go work in the Red Light District? You don't find young Dutch girls doing that. What you find are very poor, economically depressed, and, and you know, usually those individuals who don't have access to civil justice from Eastern Europe and in some cases Africa end up in Western cities uh, uh, in the commercial sex industry. So, you know, if you look at the data, it just doesn't justify that. Yeah. And as you say, I mean, I think that there's a certain amount of evidence that where you have a legalize and regulate model that side by side with adults um, who are selling sex who are not, you know, nobody not being forced so much uh, that you tend to have a parallel market of underage girls and girls who are trafficked uh, that, that kind of goes along right along, the, the one encourages the other. You're right, Nick. I, I don't think any of the panelists here, and we get misconceived, like Rachel said, in terms of the hype, as being anti-prostitution, anti-sex worker. Really what we are is against forced labor. We're against coercion, against having people's rights taken away from them. So we need to come up with more creative ways to be able to distinguish that, I reckon. Um, in Amsterdam, what we did, we created a soup enterprise, a company, and invited the women who are working in the Red Light District to be chefs or, or caterers in our, our new business. And that quick flushed out, well, some said I can't because my trafficker or my pimp would beat me up or otherwise um, uh, uh, punish me. Well, then you have, a, you have a real legal problem. You have a prosecution problem. Um, now, if they say, well, look, I, I don't know if I can make as much money, you know, you get both. And so it, it's a disservice to try to paint this whole industry as one thing. It's more complex than that. Um, can can I speak uh, to that? Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I would uh, say that I'm not anti-prostitution. Um, I think it's very hard to separate the sex industry from systemic violence um, and from poverty. I think if we lived in a world where everybody's options were equal and there was no violence and there was no poverty and there was no prior sexual abuse and everybody had the same choices. Um, then I might have a different view of the sex industry. But given that the sex industry overwhelmingly preys on people, whether through force or coercion, or just through situational desperation, um, I, I can't stand behind a sex industry that overwhelmingly 70 to 90 percent of folks who end up in the sex industry, both children and adults, were victims of child sexual abuse prior to recruitment. Um, right? The, the correlation there is just too challenging for me. You know, I think one of the reasons why people don't get more engaged in this is they think that it's kind of hopeless. And there is a perception, look, this is, you know, the oldest profession in the world. It's too bad, but this is the way human beings are. And Gary, um, you conducted a fascinating study uh, in the Philippines uh, uh, that looked at how aggressive law enforcement can actually make a real difference 
in yeah. um, in ending child uh, the prostitution of children. There, can you talk a little bit about that? I always found that one of the most encouraging things about the fact that you know we can make a difference on trafficking. For sure, and I'd also like to begin by pointing out, of course, that sex trafficking as a part of human trafficking is probably maybe a quarter of the problem. So three quarters are forced into other kinds of labor. Perhaps nothing is more horrific than when the, the product being produced is a sexual service. So there's reasons, special reasons to focus on it, but most of the forced labor in the world is actually not in the, the sex business. But it's true that in Cebu, the Philippines, uh, uh, the second largest city in the Philippines that had a horrific problem of child sex trafficking, the the Gates Foundation uh, went into a project with us where we tried to see what would happen if you could stand up local law enforcement so they actually started to enforce the laws against child sex trafficking. Uh, because we find that massive amounts of human trafficking only occurs where there's a, a, a condition of impunity. That is, the people carrying it out are not really afraid of getting in trouble. So we tried to figure out in this one city, what if people actually become afraid of trafficking children in the sex industry? So for four years, we worked with local law enforcement there to not actually not only rescue victims of trafficking, but then to actually see about a hundred of the sex traffickers arrested and put through the process of, of prosecution. And what outside auditors were able to find there is a 79% reduction in the victimization of kids in the commercial sex trade over a four-year period of time. And this is the first experiment in the world, actually, where outside auditors came in and measured, well, how much sex slavery is there of kids to start with? And then after we do some effective law enforcement work, what's the amount of uh, sex trafficking of kids uh, afterwards? And we were not able, over those four years of time, to, sort of, to uh, in any reasonable way, reduce poverty, but what we did is we made the sex traffickers afraid of going to jail and we found that they're just not brave. When they start going to jail, they leave the kids alone. But in the developing world, the primary problem, like in a place like South Asia, the statistics show that if you enslave someone in South Asia, you are in greater risk of being hit by lightning than you are of going to jail for that. So I don't know how scared everybody feels today about being hit by lightning. I don't think we do. We feel exactly in regard to lightning the way a, a trafficker does in the developing world because there's no fear that you will actually be brought to justice for that. And, and likewise, in, um, in terms of the demand side, I mean, although Johns are sometimes uh, arrested uh, in the U.S., for example, it's pretty much the same as being hit by lightning. I mean, there is pretty much complete uh, impunity. I, I just crunching some numbers recently. It looked as if there was one half of one percent risk in any sexual transaction of uh, of, of actually being arrested. Um, Susan, um, let me ask you. I mean, you're looking at some of the most challenging global problems related to trafficking around the world, and I assume that this. Um, is linked to conflict in many cases. We have an array of conflicts these days from Syria to South Sudan to Central African Republic. Um, you know, a lot of West Africa is pretty messy these days. I wondered, as you look to 2014, what are the areas that, you know, lead you to wake up in the middle of the night worrying about human trafficking? Yeah, right, thanks. No, and just, we certainly don't sleep a lot these days. We have uh, what are characterized as three level three emergencies, um, so including the Philippines. So what I'd add to that question, Nick, is is a combination of conflict as well as natural disaster, where we have a vulnerable populations, populations that are mobile, children who are separated from their families. These are my primary uh, concerns in these contexts, and the ones you um, mentioned. You're, I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I want to throw a stat in here, if I may. The data we've looked at in terms of this issue of impunity um, is for every 800 victims of trafficking, we've got one conviction. Right. So on that side, we're really, wow. you know, doing a, a pretty poor job. And and then just to, to this, you know, what keeps us awake at night when we think about where our children vulnerable, and we're seeing that the nature of conflict is changing and the frequency of natural disaster on the rise. So, you know, not to paint an overly bleak picture, but but the world's not a great place for kids and their protection right now. And what we're finding is that where 
where child protection services and systems are already weak. So as you pointed out, you know, in the Syrias, in the, the uh, Congo, the Central African Republic, um, I'd say less so in the Philippines, which has done a really good job of protecting children after that natural disaster. But, but you know, a, a, around the world, um, the weaknesses in, and, and Rachel, to speak to your point, the weaknesses in protecting children even within their own families and communities these are where early incidents of violence and their experience of violence in their life lead them to later vulnerabilities, make them vulnerable to other things. And those are the, you know, I know some of the, the girls you work with, Rachel, and, and in many of the shelters that we support around the world, we see that children who are there uh, tend to have experienced, uh, have negative childhood experiences mm -hmm. earlier on. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that UNICEF is actually trying to address at the core. Now, in a Central African Republic where we've got populations moving, we've got basically a lack of, of justice and rule of law, these are particularly vulnerable spots for for trafficking. And then, you know, I, I, I totally agree with, with both David and Gary that we're talking about trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation, but for so many other things, including into military groups, paramilitary groups. Um, uh, and, and these are deeply concerning. They're things we're able to have an impact on, happily, but uh, not nearly enough investment, not nearly enough political will would be my big advocacy push here. Uh, we got to keep these kinds of conversations going. There are people in the world who don't even know trafficking exists, uh, let alone know they need to be doing something about it. Nick, could I add a quick point to that? This is this is Gary. Uh, simply to say that absolutely our experience is that those sorts of conflicts and disasters add to the vulnerability tremendously. But if you look at the world global numbers, two-thirds of the slavery problem is in three countries right now, India, China, and Pakistan, in terms of just the sheer numbers. And those are all, okay, Pakistan has some clear difficulties, but most of the slaves in Pakistan are in the more secure parts of the country, actually. Um, so. To, that's that's about 15 million people in slavery in three countries that are quite stable. So it's both this thing that takes advantage of horrific vulnerabilities, but also can be happening right underneath our noses in relatively stable conditions. We uh, have some questions coming in, and the question that has been um, voted up, if you will, the most popular question in the Q&A right now, um, has to do with the question of how we get men engaged as part of the solution, not just part of the problem. Um, and, you know, I, what's your take? What, what, what can be done? You know, uh, Dave, Nick, um, you know, I, I think part of the challenge is the way that we, we position the movement as being at the end of a river, pulling out bodies, and it's mostly children and women. And that's compassion. That that's really an important part of this movement is to be able to give immediate aid to those who are in crisis. Um, but there is a you know it's a complicated thing for a man to then be involved in that kind of work at that you know in the way that the movement is positioned and thought of. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, what, you know we need to walk upstream and think of the whole myriad of ways around prevention and around long-term solutions to these problems, which require all of us, any of us that have a gift. You know, Gary's organization, they're looking for great lawyers of both women and men. Um, not for sale, we're trying to create business solutions. We need people who have experience in finance and building companies and creating real jobs and real income for communities. That's not a gender-oriented activity. So really it's, it's rethinking what it means to be involved in the abolitionist movement. And so it takes some work on the part of us as well. We're partly to blame to, to kind of suggest that it's just simply give help to this young child or give help to this woman. But it's really, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's about dignity. It's not just about, you know, a short-term intervention. Any others I, want to weigh in on that question? I yeah. would. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Susan. No, after you. Go ahead, please. I mean, I would just say that if we're talking very specifically about kind of sex trafficking and even the violence that permeates young people's lives, prior to, as Susan was just referencing, domestic violence, sexual abuse. I mean, it's really about shifting um, our cultural ideas about that. I mean, right, when one in three, one in four women in this country alone are going to be victims of sexual assault or domestic violence within their lifetime, that's an epidemic. And right now, I mean, we can talk 
a lot, right? We we see a lot more enthusiasm and excitement around the issue of slavery and trafficking than we do around child sexual abuse um, and domestic violence. And those two things are absolutely epidemics in our country and in our world. And so, beginning to socialize boys and men um, around healthy relationships and intimacy and violence and gender equality and all of those not just don't buy sex from girls and women but right what does what does it look like on the positive side um, and recognizing that men should be the ones having those conversations with boys um, right I mean I can talk to girls all day long but there's a very different kind of strategy that men can have talking to boys and so I think it's about socializing the boys who are coming up and young men um, in a very different way than we have in the past. Yeah, if I if I can, Nick, Susan here, I just wanted to add a couple of, you know, kind of concrete examples where, I mean, we've been working with um, mm -hmm. Well, a number of, of non-government organizations, civil society organizations that that work with men and boys. Um, and we had one really interesting experiment a few years ago, which we're we're going to start ramping up, and, and that was around coaching boys into men and actually working through the sporting world where you know so many young people are engaged and and really trying to, as we do on so many issues in protecting children, addressing the underlying social norms that either make something okay or not okay. And and as I was listening to, to you and, and, and to you, David, I was thinking about children I know who have been trafficked um, uh, you know, in, in India into middle class homes to be domestic servants. And mm -hmm. it wouldn't be perceived on, on one hand as being a classic case of trafficking because it may be an extended family member or, or that's helping get the child there or where the child is. But the fact is, it's okay. It's a norm. It's not perceived as something that's not right. And you know, it's why I well, I appreciate the work of all of you and and the U.S. Fund for UNICEF running this uh, awareness raising around trafficking right now because we have to change. And I'm my my money's on young people. My money's on the millennials for changing the world in this regard and saying it's not okay to ignore, like you said, David, the dignity of others or the fact is this is another human being. This is an outrage that we can abuse and exploit. Okay, I'm passionate about children, but because of you know, I work for UNICEF, but across the board, how is it that we cannot, as a human society, see the other as the same as me. And for me, that's the underlying social norm that has to change. And we're seeing it change in some places. Um, and I could give you more examples. I love the early conversation about the engagement of law enforcement. We're seeing community policing actually working in some places, changing the attitude of law enforcement towards kids they find on the streets. You know, it's, 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 it's complex, it's long term infinitely doable but it really requires changing mindsets about how we see other people or within our own country poor people or people of color or whoever the other is because it's it, in most cases I know it's not entirely true um, that that it's all sort of marginalized populations who end up victimized but the bulk are not you know your next door neighbor although that could be true too, but I'm just saying there's there's a definite a, a social perception and attitude that is driving much of the exploitation, mm -hmm. and and I'll say in in particular of children, how we can imagine it's okay to have sex with a ten year old, or it's okay to enslave a six year old who will be taking care of my children, who will be sleeping in a you know a four by four kitchen at night uh, for five hours, uh, who will never get to play or go to school. I mean, it's an outrage. I'd just like to weigh in also on this question of engaging uh, men a little bit. Uh, I think that there are two misconceptions sometimes that I'd like to, uh, to push back on. You know, one is that the basic problem is just men, and it's so much more complicated than that. I mean, uh, especially in other countries, so many of the traffickers uh, are women, because a woman can go into a village and recruit girls and say she's taking them to a restaurant, and people may trust her. Uh, so, you know, it's... Um, uh, there, there's a broad problem here. Um, and I guess the second point I'd make is that while we certainly need to change norms and men's attitudes, um, that that's a long process. And I think there is a certain shortcut, which is to end the impunity, to make people scared. And that goes to the point that Gary made about what happened in Cebu in the Philippines. And I think it's also, frankly, what we saw in the U.S. I think a lot of Americans don't appreciate that... Um, uh, reported 
rape rates, according to the Department of Justice in the U.S., fell by two-thirds over the last 40 years. Two-thirds. And you know, why did that happen? Uh, essentially because most rape in the U.S. is acquaintance rape. Mm. And um, 40 years ago, people could get away with that. It was essentially something the police were not very interested in. Now people get away with it too much, but it's more risky. And uh, the result has been uh, this remarkable decline in, in that. And I think there's a lesson for the U.S. and for all the world that you make people pay a price, you end impunity, and even if attitudes haven't changed, behavior will. Can I piggyback off of that, uh, Nick, just for a second? Because Martin Luther King Jr. said, the law can't make you love me, but it can stop you from lynching me, and that matters. And likewise, for those who are in slavery right now, it's a long road sometimes to change larger attitudes, but you can bring to bear a reasonable fear that if I'm going to enslave you, I'm going to actually get in trouble for that. And there's this tremendous actually synergy between cultural attitudes and law enforcement, because believe me, in the places where we work of slavery, you can say those uh, poor people are wonderful, and mm -hmm. those girls are wonderful, and those lower caste people are wonderful, but if you don't enforce the law against someone who enslaves them, you send the most powerful cultural message possible that you have no dignity, you have no worth. On the other hand, you march a guy off to jail for a serious jail term who has ex enslaved and exploited that otherwise undervalued child or girl, all of a sudden we can see not only in the heart of that, that survivor themselves their own sense of dignity, but also in the community, the whole attitude towards that class of people is amazingly affected by the weather, by the question of whether the law is or not enforced. Yeah, I like, I like to add into that too. Uh, thanks, Gary. And I, I, I really, uh, I think it's important the the work that you did in in the Philippines to actually monitor and report on actual change over time, so that right. you know, we're held accountable to our strategies. Are they working or not? Right. Uh, what we're really focusing on is how economic empowerment leads to respect from rule of law, leads to um, more empowerment in terms of the choices that people can make. You know, we talk about teaching someone to fish, but if they don't own equity in the pond, they're still vulnerable to someone telling whether or not they can fish or not. So how do we measure? And what we do is we give quarterly reports on how economic impact leads to a reduction in, in trafficking and vulnerability. Really we're talking about, a, 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 it's not just one silver bullet here. It's about rule of law, it's about economic empowerment, it's about cultural changes. And so those three, they all go hand in hand. And we need to be able to have strategies that are accountable, measurable, and, and best practices. So in 2014, we really see changes. It's not about, you know, none of us are here just for a job and a gig. We really want to see this exploitation end. But we need to create the kind of strategies and the accountability for those strategies that we can really measure our, our, the difference we're making. Can I, and I'll just, can I just add something there too because um, I like the three sort of pillars that you've suggested. I think that among many problems we've had in the trafficking fight has been the fact that the bulk of the resources have gone into one pillar which I would call law enforcement and border control. That is where the bulk of the international you know, community's resources have gone. And so there isn't a balance with the other things that, that you're describing. Um, so I, I think that's really well characterized, actually. And this is Rachel. I mean, I, I just to piggyback off what Susan's saying, I mean, I think there is a desire, as, as you were saying too, Nick, right, to, to find the short-term solutions. And I think we are often very attracted in the movement to kind of rescue strategies, lock them up, poor little girls, bad men, right, like, and, and removing any complexity, removing any kind of long-term strategy. And so, I mean, my hope in, in 2014 is that we are really moving towards a much more nuanced conversation, um, that we are seeing the, the resources and funding kind of spread to economic development, to prevention, to early childhood intervention, to all of the things that we know um, can make a difference and that law enforcement is absolutely a, a critical component of that, but it isn't the only component of that and it won't be the thing that long term changes this issue. Mm. I'd like to challenge some of this just a, a little bit. I share the point of view that this uh, that's a complex issue that has lots of different um, uh, sort of sources and, uh, and implications. But I would want to uh, argue quite strenuously that slavery is first and foremost a violent crime. That is to say, it's a crime of violence. And 
if you were to look at any other crime that would take place in our community that's a violent one, let's say rape were taking place in our community, we would of course want to look at changing those attitudes. We would of course want to make sure that the streets were well lit. We would want to make sure that women knew how to uh, walk safely uh, and avoided dangerous areas. But you would start absolutely first with, and you would find it very hard to proceed forward without making sure that people who committed sexual assaults in that community actually went to jail for it. So as long as we have communities and places in the world, and this is the true of where there are the most slaves, the most trafficking, where truly you are more likely to uh, get struck by lightning than go to jail for committing that violent crime, if that thing doesn't change, I believe, we're always going to be working uphill uh, against what is right now just a massive crime of opportunity. Once you reduce the soft crime, then yes, there's a whole other sort of larger edge of this crime prevention that has to get at societal roots, attitudes, and so forth. But right now, in the places where most slaves are, the level of impunity is so great that we can be hitting those other issues long and hard, and we'll need to because they're part of the total solution. But the absence of a critical threat that I'll get in trouble if I enslave someone, that's going to undercut us every single day. You know, uh, I, I, I like to challenge that, Gary, uh, Gary because, uh, you know, if I look at the South, the United States, at, at the time of, uh, you know, when we uh, made slavery illegal, coercion uh, took other forms. It took other economic forms and continued for the next 200 years. Um, I'm struck by the people that I meet trafficked. You know, say a young girl from Sausalito, which is across the bridge from where I live in San Francisco, were trafficked. Her community would clamor for justice because they're economically empowered. They would get a response from law enforcement. They would get... So there's a, there's a real close connection between economic empowerment, having a voice, and getting civil rights. So it's not either or. I really believe it's both and. I, I, I will say, yeah. though, that the reason that person in cell, uh, uh, there's, there's you know, less than 1% of the slaves are in a context in the United States where you have at least a functioning law enforcement apparatus. And the, if you look at the difference between where the massive number of slaves are and where the massive number of slaves aren't, the thing that so clearly distinguishes them is an impunity index. And, and I'm not saying it's the only thing that um, needs to be addressed, but if you look in the developing world and the amount of uh, uh, effort that's been put to fixing food systems, water systems, road systems, education system, health systems, and you look at the amount of effort that has been put at addressing the brokenness of the criminal justice system, they're way out of whack. And so I just think that's a realignment that's going to be important. It's not the end all, forever all, but the most broken system in the places where there's the most slavery is the brokenness of the criminal justice system. Can I, can I can ask Tasha a question? Can I question? jump really quick? Okay. Um, I would just say that, right, as you were saying, rape um, stats have gone down. We have criminalized rape. We've criminalized domestic violence. But we still live in a rape culture, um, right? We still live in a society where societal sure. attitudes around rape are really, really frightening. And you can get 15, 20, 30 years for raping someone. And yet, we live in a culture where rape is actually in many ways encouraged and supported and right so and, and with the domestic violence movement the criminal justice solution was seen as kind of the be all and end all and so 20 30 years on what now domestic violence advocates who were around then are saying is we wish we'd done it a little bit differently because the criminalization of this issue has has cut out all the grassroots empowerment stuff has stopped people because you can lock up somebody but that person person gets out and they still reoffend. You can separate somebody from their abuser, but their vulnerability is still there, and then they end up being abused again. So I think, right, the criminal justice piece is one piece, but I think, especially in the U.S., right, it, it needs to not be the only piece, because it's not the only solution. Especially in the United States, but if you go to a Bolivia a country, for instance, where if you rape a child in Bolivia, it's demonstrated that you have a greater chance of slipping in the shower and dying than you do of going to jail for that. So it's just we're talking about such different contexts. Uh, I do believe you can criminalize things in a totally insufficient way like we've done here in the United States, but in some places of the world, oh my goodness, the impunity is so massive, it's a, a very uh, massive floor that's sort of falling out underneath all of our other efforts. Um, but Gary, folks, again, we're, we're almost out of time, but uh, yeah. I'd, we're almost out of time, but um, 
I'd <laughs> like to actually ask each of you um, kind of what a viewer can do. But but before that, let me ask just toss one other question out there, and that is that you know there are probably not a lot of um, Johns watching, a lot of traffickers watching, but there are a lot of other kinds of of uh, of, of modern slavery, of course, uh, outside of, of sex. And indeed, we may be uh, watching this on laptops, for example, on screens that uh, have products that were created with modern trafficking. So what about um, supply chains as an issue in, in 2014? And is there more we can do for those who you know, are not engaged in this effort to try to clean up our own act? Hmm. Uh, just jumping in very quickly, um, there are two kinds of impunity. There's criminal impunity and there's commercial impunity. And right now there's also a state of commercial impunity. And the business world needs to step up and deal with that within their supply chains. And this is where a lot of consumer awareness and building of the positive kinds of opportunities that David has been talking about have a super critical role. So I, I very much agree with you on that, Nick. Um, Nick if I can. Sorry, go ahead. We've taken two approaches to this, uh, Nick. Uh, one is to actually start creating our own companies. You know, I got a product placement here, Rebel. It's a it's a beverage we created. It's now in Whole Foods around the country, and uh, we source the product in places where there's great vulnerability. Southeast Asia um, and uh, the Amazon of Peru and Eastern Europe. So we have several uh, product companies, but also um, then creating a sourcing company that we we are now working with Levi's producing jackets um, in in China. So. We're changing the way the supply chain is done. Now, at the same time, you need to create the kind of protocols and accountability that Gary's talking about. So I really do see economic uh, solutions um, in, in tandem with uh, uh, rule of law and, uh, and accountability together with changing cultural mores. I think we have to do all three in 2014. And it's neither, you know, neither valuing one or the other. It needs to be, as Rachel says, a parallel investment in all three and a parallel concern around all three. Um, so now let me toss out this question to each of you, and I, it, it, it came in various forms, but a lot of people wanted to know basically what they can do. And, and um, one person says that uh, we're watching this in our grade 10 class. Uh, how can we help those fighting to stop slavery and other forms of trafficking? So for those 10th graders out there watching, for anybody else who is concerned about this, is moved by this, if they're moved to action, so what can they do? Um, why don't we um, Why don't we just go left to right on the screen, uh, David? Yeah, you know, to those watching, I, I really feel it's more than just um, you know writing me a check. Although you can write us all a check, that'd be great. But it's about um, you know my slogan is be everywhere, which means to have dignity in everything you do. Make it a lifestyle. You know, in terms of when I when I go to Thailand, people nudge, nudge, wink, wink, other men that I'm going on a sex holiday. It's like, no, I don't do that. That's not what a, man, a real man does. So it's in in the way that you just live culturally, the way that I buy products, buy products where you know where the products were made, and you're enhancing the lives of the people who made those products rather than limiting their options, taking away their destiny. So be everywhere. That is everything you do. Do it with dignity. Gary, what do you suggest? Yeah, one of the thing we, things we all have is a voice, and uh, for everybody, especially in the United States right now, their voice matters a lot. There's legislation going through the Congress right now called the Human Trafficking Prioritization Act, and it does a lot of things, but one of the important things it does is it makes sure that the, the trafficking office in the State Department is elevated to a bureau, which sounds like a uh, you know inside baseball sort of thing, but it makes the difference as to whether or not in our foreign policy uh, trafficking is addressed as a priority. So there's legislation now that we're collecting co-sponsors for. We've got about 50 in the House and 20 in the Senate. We need more, but those sponsorships come when local people in the voters in the district tell their congressmen that it matters to them. So um, here's our little um, IJM, uh, hope you can see that. Uh, if you just go to this um, uh, site, then we can't, there is, there's some instructions there about how to lend your voice to the effort on this trafficking act, and that will, I think, will make the biggest difference possible. So, uh, help support uh, the passage of this act. Great. Um, you're well prepared, Gary. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Rachel, what do you suggest? When people ask you, you know, what, what do you suggest? Um, well, I only have a cup of tea by me, unfortunately. To wrap. <laughs> um, that's a, I was trying to think of a good analogy for that, but I actually can't. Um, 
I will, I will say that I think when people hear about trafficking, and again, there's that very emotional response to it, and oftentimes we'll have people calling Gem saying, you know, I want to go out and rescue girls in the middle of the night, and I want to, you know, really get hands on. Um, a lot of what we, we tell people is we would really encourage you to go mentor at Big Brother, Big Sister, mm -hmm. um, and engage in the life of a child over the next four to five years consistently and right as, as, as Dave said with dignity um, and providing dignity for that young person and that child is so much less likely to walk in the doors of GEMS in five years um, right we are right now looking at I, GEMS has now been around for 15 years I'm looking at young people walking in the door now who were found who were who were born a couple of years after GEMS was founded and I keep thinking about what does the next 15 years look like and what does that look like in terms of young people who are in our city right now who are going to have vulnerabilities to this issue. So I really encourage people not just to think about, right, how can I find the, the local trafficking organization and go rescue people, but how am I making a long-term systemic difference? How am I working on anti-poverty work? How am I working on good educational reforms and child welfare reforms and anti-racism? Frankly, this panel is not the most representative, um, and I think that's an issue in the trafficking movement. Um, Right? How am I? How am I speaking up for all of those systemic issues? And and that may not feel as sexy um, as some of the rescue stuff, but it's going to be the stuff that long term makes a real difference. And T. <laughs> <laughs> and Susan. Uh, wow. What is um, your suggestion? Well, everything everybody else said, and um, I guess two two things, two words come to mind for me, and it's especially I'm speaking to the 10th graders, but one is, and I think you're doing it already, and that is get informed, read, uh, listen. Um, so, you know, inform yourself. I've got a ninth grader. Uh, poor thing has me as a mom, but, you know, in terms of there's stuff to read out there, there's stuff to watch. Be discerning about what you're reading and watching uh, and, and, you know, be a little analytical. That's one. Two get engaged. Now, I'm, I'm not American, so I, 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 I'm not as familiar with the legislation that Gary's talking about, but I will say what I've learned since I, I, I was posted here in New York is that there are still states in the United States that do not have legislation to protect child victims of trafficking from being taken into criminal processes. That to me seems really simple, something you can write to your congressman about and get involved in. There are so many other things. Most importantly, from my perspective, my colleagues at the U.S. Fund for UNICEF are running, running their first ever domestic campaign called End Trafficking. You can go online and find that. And that it links to many, many other initiatives here in the U.S. which are so important. My final comment is, and I, I just I can't say enough about the fact that um, I feel that this issue is situated within a very violent world. Uh, and that violence against children is something we really, really, really need to raise up the ladder, up onto the MDG agenda, the Millennium Development Goals post-2015. And so if there are ways for, for young people to get involved in that movement and that lobbying and that advocacy to make our world a safer, uh, safer protected space for kids to live out uh, the kind of childhood uh, I imagine we all aspire to for our own children. That would be what I would say to a 10th grade class and to thank them for getting engaged today. Um, I would just offer my own two suggestions to those 10th graders um, and to anybody else. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention there's an anti-trafficking hotline. And so if you see something that arouses your concern, uh, <laughs> then you can call that hotline. It's one uh, 888 Three seven three seven eight eight eight, and you can if you forget the number. You can just Google it; it it'll come up right away. And I guess the other thing I would suggest to those tenth graders is that um, you know one thing one can have a voice on is the local policy of one's local police department, local prosecutors, and there does tend to be this um, effort to uh, arrest the women and girls out on the street and not the pimps and not the Johns. And uh, local voices can help change that. And I think that helps end that impunity that the panel has been talking about. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. I'm sorry we didn't get more of a chance to address more of your questions, but um, you can go and, and 
contact each of these organizations, go to their websites, uh, learn more, and get engaged, whether it's through donations, through volunteering, through advocacy. Uh, all are needed. And I hope you'll stay active in this issue in 2014. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you all. Thank you, guys.